Good evening, I'm Bruce Goldstein, Film Forum's Director of Repertory Programming, and it's my great pleasure to welcome our special guest, the legendary cinematographer John Bailey, whose many credits include Ordinary People, The Big Chill, Silverado, The Accidental Tourist, Groundhog Day, As Good As It Gets, American Gigolo, and Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. John has also directed such films as China Moon, starring Ed Harris, David Hare's Via Dolorosa, Lily Tomlin's The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe, and the IMAX concert film In Sync, Bigger Than Live. If I were to rattle off all his credits, we'd be here all night. John was on the board of governors of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for 15 years and beginning in 2017, served two terms as the Academy president. John also has a great interest in film preservation and also served as the vice president and chair of the Academy's Preservation and History Committee. In February 2015, he was honored by the American Society of Cinematographers with its Lifetime Achievement Award. Prior to becoming a director of photography himself, John worked as a crew member with such greats as Nestor Elmendros and Vilmos Zygmunt, and on such classic films as Robert Altman's Three Women, Terrence Malick's Days of Heaven, and tonight's film, Monty Hellman's Tulane Blacktop. Please welcome from his home in Los Angeles, my friend, John Bailey. Thank you, Bruce. It's great to be with you all for these uh, uh, screenings of uh, Tulane Blacktop, even though it's virtual. Uh, I wish Carol and I could be in New York with you. Uh, we have an apartment since 1983 on the Upper West Side near Lincoln Center, uh, but we hope to be back soon. The April 1971 cover of Esquire magazine featured a full figure low angle promo photo of 17 year old actress, Laurie Bird, her left hand jutting out in classic hitchhiker pose. The copy exclaims, read it first, our nomination for the best picture of the year. The film so vaunted was Tulane Blacktop. Esquire also published the full screenplay by Rudy Wurlitzer and Will Corey. Released barely three months later to mostly ungenerous, even disdainful reviews, Tulane quickly disappeared. Director Monty Hellman, the cast and crew were shocked, as was I, the film's 29-year-old first assistant cameraman. This movie was my first major studio credit, and I felt very excited driving past the title emblazoned on a Hollywood Boulevard first-run movie house's marquee. The film's cinematographer was Gregory Sandor, who had photographed Monty's two previous films of 1966, westerns titled Shooting and Ride in the Whirlwind, both starring Monty's friend, Jack Nicholson. I had become Greg Sandor's go-to camera assistant after we did a series of ultra low budget black and white films shot in Armenian in the San Fernando Valley on 35 millimeter short ends. I had been in the union barely a year and was a low man in seniority experience roster. Sandor, a Hungarian Cuban outsider, was not even in the main Hollywood union, so he never got a screen credit as Tulane's director of photography. That went instead to a standby union man whose sole contribution was to drop an Aeroflex 2C camera when asked to shoot a handheld panning shot of the primer gray 55 Chevy as it roared across the Mojave Desert. Tulane Blacktop was no A-list film. The script had been passed on by numerous studios, but finally greenlit by Universal Studio executive Ned Tannen, who recently had initiated a series of films to be budgeted for under $1 million. The union allocated special crew staffing and lower pay for these low budget films. Our first night shooting on the Sunset Strip was less than half a mile from the union offices. 
Sondor and I were expecting to be called out by the gnarly union business agent, Herb Allen, when he appeared on set. Taking me aside, he said, Bailey, I want you to keep your eyes on this guy, Sondor. Make sure he doesn't try anything funny. I said, sure thing, Herb, you can count on me. Clearly, he was not yet aware of my loyalty to Greg or of my own vulnerable union status. Next night, we shot a street drag race in the West Valley that became the main title sequence. Greg and I didn't breathe easily until two days later, when we were out of LA, off on a cross country cinematic odyssey that ended several months later on an abandoned airport runway outside Memphis. The story of how this once reviled, nearly forgotten film was rediscovered, becoming a time capsule classic of 1970s new American cinema is told in Sylvia Townsend's book, Bumpy Road, The Making, Flop, and Revival of Tulane Blacktop. The Criterion Collection has issued a Blu-ray of the film with lots of extras, including outtakes and interviews with the filmmakers. But perhaps the easiest entry point into this admittedly enigmatic laconic film comes from an unlikely source, one that best defines Monty Hellman's cinematic style. In the early 1950s, Monty had founded a small theater company in Los Angeles. Here, in 1957, he directed in an unlikely Western setting, the very first LA production of Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godhold. In a 1969 Vogue magazine interview, Beckett said of his own work, every word is like an unnecessary stain on silence and nothingness. In the film Monty made after Too Late, Cockfighter, lead actor Warren Oates says not a word in most of the film. The anonymous back roads and blue highways in Too Late Blacktop are images that echo the sear barren landscape of Beckett's great play. Monty's last film appropriately is titled Road to Nowhere. Tulane is photographed in a format called Technoscope, developed by Technicolor Lab Rome. It was used for its very deep focus quality in Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Westerns. The release aspect ratio of 240 to 1 is the same as Cinescope, but much cheaper making it very tempting to Monty and Greg. Instead of the regular four perforation film frame, this cut rate process employed cameras altered to produce a two perf pull down, exposing 45 feet a minute rather than 90 feet. Expensive Kodak Rostock use would be cut in half, though this did not apply to Monty, who shot film as though he were a Kodak stockholder. The dailies had to be printed on a slow speed optical printer, blowing up the two perf frame to the anamorphic four perf one for theater projection. Because of this intermediate step, our dailies often arrived on location after we had shot the scenes, making an uneasy studio even more so. The upside, however, to using Technoscope was the use of much wider focal length lenses than ones used in Cinemascope or Panavision. A master shot could be captured with an 18 millimeter lens, which had a very deep depth of field. In conjunction with the wide aspect ratio, it was easier to stage action requiring fewer editorial cuts, a technique that Monty and Greg used in much of the film. This is ironic since Monty began his film career as an editor and between his own movies, often worked as an editorial film doctor. This technique of longer takes, one shot evolving into the next is dubbed by French filmmakers, Plan Séquence, and was embraced by one of Monty's favorite directors, Robert Bresson. 
One of the best examples of this style in Tulane is the gas station scene outside Tucumcari, New Mexico, where James Taylor and Warren Oates key the action by making a racing bet for their car's pink slips. In the middle of this sequence, squats a strangely awkward scene between Laurie Bird and Taylor in minimalist conversation away from the gas station. Beckett's ghostly long voice hovers over this scene. I have a few thoughts about the gentle artist who photographed this film. Gregory Sondor was my mentor. I learned set decorum and respect for my fellow crew members from his quiet presence, as well as compositional aesthetics and the technique of classical three-point lighting, a style different from the available light style of the French New Wave, then animating the new American cinema. And here's a final image. No matter what roadhouse or motel coffee shop evening meal was at hand, Greg had a dining ritual. After his meatloaf, chicken fried steak, or plate of the day, Greg would order one scoop of vanilla ice cream to accompany his single post-prandial cigarette, a rice paper wrapped oval Mexican brand called Delicados. With the sweet smoke hovering over our table, Greg reflected on that day's work, quietly pointing me toward the starting line of my own 50 year course as a feature film cinematographer. Thank you very much for letting me be with you. Hope to be back to New York soon. <laughs>